Hello, today we're going to go over the uh, physics portion of the STAR test and we're going to start off with speed, velocity, and acceleration. So first off, uh, speed is going to be equal to distance divided by time. Think of miles per hour. The units are typically going to be meters per second or kilometers per hour. The key difference between it and velocity is velocity has a direction associated with it and speed does not. So like speed would be let's say 35 miles per hour or 35 meters per second. Velocity is going to be speed and direction. So like 35 miles, let's say 35 meters per second north since you have a direction that makes it a velocity. That is the only difference between speed and velocity is velocity has direction. Acceleration is going to be any change in velocity. That would be speeding up, slowing down, and turning. Alright, let's go ahead and look at unbalanced forces and how they basically affect acceleration. Alright, basically an unbalanced force will cause an acceleration. So if you have an unbalanced force, the object will either speed up, slow down, or turn. Anytime you see an object, anytime you see an object speed up, slow down, or turn, you know that there's been an unbalanced force because it caused it to accelerate. And anytime you see an unbalanced, anytime there is an unbalanced force, you know it will accelerate. So it's kind of a, it goes back and forth. If you see the unbalanced force, you know there's an acceleration. If you see something that's an acceleration, you know it's an unbalanced force. And you can see it either way on the STAR test. Alright, let's go ahead and look at how we calculate those. Alright, if the, if the unbalanced forces are pushing in the same direction, you add them together. So in the top picture here, basically the two forces were pushing in the same direction. So you would add the five, basically the 5 newtons with the 10 newtons, giving you a net force of 15. However, if you are pushing against each other, or pulling against each other, like at the bottom picture, you would take the 10 newtons, subtract it by the uh, 5, and your net force would be 5 newtons in the direction of the stronger force. So the object would basically move towards the right. Alright, let's go ahead and look at balanced forces. Alright, balanced forces are basically when both forces are equal and in the opposite direction. Their total or the net force is going to be zero and will cause no change in motion. Basically, the object will either stay at a constant speed or it will stay at rest because there's no force causing it to speed up or slow down. Alright, that's going to bridge way kind of into um, Newton's three laws. And we're going to start off by looking at his first law. Alright, basically, that's kind of stating Newton's first law, also called the law of inertia. It states objects at rest stay at rest, or objects in motion will stay in motion until an unbalanced force, you know, stops them or causes them to move. So basically, if you're driving in a car and you get in a wreck or you slam on the brakes, you're going to want to keep moving at whatever speed you know the car was already moving at. Like if you're going 60 miles per hour, you hit a tree, your body wants to keep going 60 miles per hour. In the first picture, the seatbelt would provide the force to stop the individual. However, in the second picture, if there's no force to stop them, the man will keep moving until he hits something that could basically provide the force to stop him. That's going to be the basically inertia. Inertia is the tendency for an object to stay in motion or resist a change in motion as far as if it's sitting still, it doesn't want to start moving. Alright, let's go ahead and look at one more example of this and we'll move on. Alright, if you had someone standing on a, on a train, when the train starts moving forward, the person, if he's not like sitting in a seat, wants to stay where he is. So basically when the train starts moving the the person starts to fall backwards because he wants to stay stationary. Now if he's holding on to a lever like the diagram shows 
he can provide enough force to stand up straight. Once he does, he'll start moving with the train and he'll re basically continue moving with the train until a force stops him. This is another example of Newton's law of inertia. Alright, let's go ahead and look at his second law. Now his second law is the law of force and acceleration and it deals with, well, force and acceleration. It states that the force of an object will be equal to its mass multiplied by its acceleration. And that kind of makes sense. Heavier objects moving at the same acceleration have more force. Or, if the object is moving faster, it has more force. Kind of like if someone throws a baseball. If they throw it fast, it has more force than if he kind of throws it slow. I right, also got to look at a couple examples and move on. If you look here, both balls were given the same amount of force, one newtons of force. It, however, the soccer ball has a much greater acceleration. And the reason being, the heavier the object is, or the more mass the object has, the less acceleration given the same amount of force. All right, let's look at one more example. This has two objects of um, equal size. One of them has more acceleration, therefore it would have more force. Or you could look at it as if you put more force into the object, it'll have a greater acceleration. All right, let's look at his third law. The third law is called action-reaction. And it states for every force, there's an equal force in the opposite direction. And this one is, it's a little bit more difficult until you start thinking about it. every force, like if you put your foot, if you push down with your foot, you would go up, or if you jumped, you put force down to the ground, however you go up. And that can only be explained by a, for however much force you put down, the same amount goes back up into you. Here's a good example of this, like when we did the balloon lab. When the air pushes out of the balloon, the balloon goes up, because however much force goes out of the balloon, the same amount goes back in the opposite direction. This is also true for uh, if you're launching a rocket. However much force goes down on the, from the rocket as far as the gas is burning, the same amount of force pushes the rocket back up. Or, let's say you're hopping off of a boat. The boat basically, when it's on the water, has very little friction. So if you push back on the boat, you should go forward. Or if a cannon's firing, when the cannon basically has the gunpowder explode, however much force went into the cannonball, the same amount of force goes back into the cannon. However, the cannon does not accelerate as fast as the cannonball because, well, the cannon has much more mass. All right, let's go ahead and move on to how we uh, graph some of this um, for speed and that sort of thing. All right, when looking at a graph on the star test, the first thing we always do is circle our units. So this one is measuring time versus distance. And basically, that's going to be what we call a speed graph. Now, anytime you're measuring distance versus time, a straight line always means a constant speed. So anytime you see a straight line, it's going to be a constant speed. Now, our flat line, if the line is flat, then basically that means the object is at rest. Because as you can see, the distance is not going up. The distance isn't changing, but time is still clicking along. So that's why it goes at a flat line until the object starts moving again. Now, the last thing we're going to look at is if it's a curved line. Now, if it's a curved line, then it is going to be an acceleration because the amount of distance you're covering increases or decreases. If it's curving up, basically it's a positive acceleration. The object's getting faster. If it curves and flattens out, the object is slowing down and then eventually coming to a stop. All right, let's go ahead and look at how we calculate average speed using a, uh, a graph. 
All right, the first step is we circle our units. It's distance versus time. And if you wanted to find the average speed for the entire graph, all you do is take the total distance the object traveled. And so basically it's traveled 30 meters. And the total time it took them, which was going to be 6 seconds. And then you just simply divide out using your formula, which is speed is equal to distance divided by time. So what you would do is you would take your 30, divide it by 6, and basically you'll get 5 meters per second. So his average speed he was covering was 5 meters per second. And basically that's all there is to it. Right, hopefully this is helpful and you'll have a great day.